Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students, welcome to the class. So I am uh, Dr. Jagdish Mahimaluru from the Department of Chemistry, Indian Institute of Technology, Tirupati. So today I am happy to offer you the course on pericyclic reactions and its applications. So as a quick reference or uh, for the information, we will just see a couple of examples which were uh, the familiar pericyclic reactions. So the conversion of an allyl vinyl ether under thermal conditions into a gamma delta unsaturated carbonyl compound involves the uh, pi electrons and uh, makes the ether to convert transform into the ketone molecule or carbonyl compound. So this is a famous pericyclic reaction and coming to the next one uh, which has uh, won a Nobel Prize also is the addition of 1,3 butadiene with malic anhydride so uh, involving the cyclic transition state resulting in the formation of a cyclic adder. So these reactions are named as Diels Alder reaction after the two scientists Otto Diels and Kurt Alder. So both have shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in the year 1950. So the former reaction allyl vinyl ether was introduced by Claisen. So these two are the examples to give you a glance at what pericyclic reactions are. Okay. So we will definitely discuss a lot more examples in the future classes. So generally this course is also offered to the undergraduate students at IIT Tirupati. So this course has very much of influence or importance for uh, the undergraduate students and also the master students of chemistry. So master students of chemistry who are aspiring for the CSIR, JRF or NET, NET or JRF and also students who are aspiring for the uh, GATE exam and some state level exam like SET, state level entrance uh, uh, exams. So pericyclic reactions are kind of unavoidable topic. So from the pericyclic reactions, you will be definitely seeing the questions for all these competitive exams and also these exams for uh, JRF, for NET, GATE and SET exam. Okay. So this pericyclic reactions course is also useful for some of the PhD students who are working in the area of organic synthesis, synthetic organic chemistry. So when the synthetic organic chemist is concentrated over the carbon-carbon bond formation. So definitely pericyclic reactions will be of their use. Okay. So for the above said uh, exams or for the PhD uh, scholars or students who are working in the area of carbon-carbon bond formation organic synthetic chemistry and also to the undergraduates. So all in all, so this pericyclic reactions course is highly useful. Okay. So to read more about the pericyclic reactions or this course, so I would uh, be suggesting you the book written by Professor S. Sankara Raman, Professor at uh, the Chemistry Department, IIT Madras. The other three books apart from uh, the book written by Professor S. Sankara Raman. So the one is The Conservation of Arbitral Symmetry by R. B. Woodward and Rudolf Hoffman. So the second one would be, so a problem solving approach the orbital symmetry by Ronald E. Lair and Alan Marchand. So organic chemistry by Clayden and uh, Warren is also a good book to be referred to understand the pericyclic reactions. So before starting this course, so we'll just try to understand the history of the organic uh, chemistry. We all know that when organic compounds combine with each other, result in the formation of new products that is uh, the 
uh, organic reaction. So the course of conversion or uh, the transformation of a molecule or an organic compound or the reactant uh, molecules to the product is called as a reaction, organic reaction, right? So several molecules, several people, scientists or several uh, scholars are uh, working day to day and then you won't believe thousands of molecules, thousands of new molecules have been synthesized per day, right? So and now millions of organic compounds are also known in the literature, already reported as well. So a typical organic reaction is nothing but the conversion or the transformation of an organic compound into the respective product is called as a typical organic reaction. So any organic reaction might fall in one of the categories. So what are those categories means? So a typical organic reaction might be because of addition, which are called as addition reactions and then are because of substitutions or eliminations or by rearrangements within the molecule and then redox reactions. So whatever uh, the organic reactions you may be studying or already have studied, so they might fall in one of the following categories. What are those categories? There are five categories of organic reactions. So maybe addition type of uh, reaction or substitution reaction, eliminations or rearrangements or redox type of reactions. It is not necessarily like always a reaction should uh, be falling in the only one category of the following. So there are certain reactions which may also fall in one or more of these category types, right? So for example, substitutions with rearrangements. What does it mean? So there is a particular transformation where you can see both the substitution of one or the two atoms from the molecule and after the substitution immediately the molecule is undergoing rearrangement within itself right so such kind of reactions are also also known and there are quite some examples for this uh, category and then uh, oxidative additions or reductive eliminations right so the combination of these categories can also be seen in a particular organic reaction let us see the five different types of organic reactions which were uh, uh, in a thorough discussion before the development of the pericyclic reactions the first one being the addition reactions so addition reactions are characteristic of an unsaturated compound like alkenes, alkynes, carbonyl compounds, etc. So addition reaction may be of three types. One is electrophilic addition reaction where the electrophile will be first taken up by the unsaturated system resulting in the formation of a carbocation. Later it will be attacked by the uh, nucleophile or the other counter anion resulting in the formation of an addition product. So in addition reactions, the unsaturated system will be converted into the saturated molecule. So coming to the nucleophilic addition reaction, so the nucleophile will attack first resulting in the formation of uh, the uh, intermediate where you can uh, see the electrophile getting grasped or absorbed by this molecule and resulting in the formation of an addition product. So radical addition reaction generally happens in the presence of a peroxide. When you uh, have uh, discussed about the Markovnikov's rule, you might have seen that the unsymmetrical alkenes, so unsaturated systems which are unsymmetrical in nature, upon addition with uh, hydrogen bromide in the presence of peroxide and in the absence of peroxide, you will be able to see two different products. So next one is the elimination reactions. 
So eliminations are again two types E1 and E1, E2. So elimination reaction, a small molecule, typically like a water molecule or a hydrogen halide is removed from a compound resulting in the formation of a double or triple bond. So when you compare addition reactions with the elimination reactions, so these two are quite opposite to each other. In the case of addition reactions, you are adding a small molecule across the double bond or a triple bond. And in elimination reaction, you are uh, removing a molecule to resulting in the formation of an unsaturated system. So these two are the examples for the elimination uh, reaction E1 and also E2. So coming to the, uh, the third category of the organic reactions, that is the substitution reactions. Again, substitution reactions is of three types, nucleophilic substitution, electrophilic substitution and radical substitution. So the replacement of one of the groups or atoms present in a molecule by a different other uh, atom or a group is called as a substitution reaction. So coming to the electrophilic substitution, in the example shown here, you can see that benzene upon uh, reaction with chlorine in the presence of Vcl3, you, you should guess what the reaction is. So I, I think you all are aware of these uh, reactions. Okay, so you'll be seeing the chlorobenzene plus hydrogen chloride. What has happened here? So benzene has not lost its aromaticity and you can see the appearance of chlorine on top of the benzene, right? So what is happening here is, so hydrogen on benzene, one of the carbon atoms of the benzene is replaced by the chlorine. So this is a typical substitution reaction, electrophilic substitution reaction. So coming to the next one, ethyl chloride upon treating with a base like sodium hydroxide, you are able to produce ethanol and sodium chloride. What has happened here? The chlorine is replaced by hydroxyl ion OH minus. So this is nucleophilic substitution reaction. So coming to the radical substitution, so methane upon reaction with the chlorine in the presence of sunlight, you will be definitely seeing the chloromethane. One thing we should remember is, so the reaction will not stop at this level until unless you cut down the supply of either of the reactant molecules okay a few more examples of the substitution reactions here you can see in the next slide the electrophilic substitution reaction where the electron loving species electrophile means what so electron loving species is going to react in the presence of the lewis acid catalyst and resulting in the formation of a substituted product the nucleophilic substitution reaction means involves the nucleus loving species that means uh, so whatever uh, the uh, species is there it is showing interaction or attraction towards the uh, positive charge okay so that means the species itself is having the negative charge so nucleophilic reaction substitution reactions so paranitrochlorobenzene upon reaction uh, is undergoing the substitution where the chloride ion is replaced by the OH minus resulting in the formation of paranitrophenol. So the other type of organic reactions are rearrangement reactions. Rearrangement is usually referred to the migration of an atom or a group of atoms from one atom to the another within a small molecule, right? So we have also seen uh, with the live example, I already told you like, so if one of you are requested to sit in the other, uh, other desk of the same class, so it indicates the rearrangement of the class, right? So similarly, if one of the atom or a group, small group in a molecule is requested to move to the different other atom or a place within the same molecule, so then we call it as the rearrangement reaction. So pinacolone pinacol rearrangement is one of the best example and benzyl benzylic acid rearrangement is also an example of rearrangement reaction which you can see here in this slide. Right. So coming to the redox reactions. So some of the reactions involves the transfer of electrons between the reactant molecules. Right. So one reactant may be asking for the electrons and the other reactant may be giving the electrons. Right. Oxidation refers to the loss of electrons, right? So loss of electrons is nothing but oxidation or removal of hydrogen is also nothing but oxidation or addition of oxygen is also oxidation. While the reduction refers to the gain of electrons, right? So oxidation means removal of electrons and reduction means gain of electrons. 
So only gain of electrons is not uh, uh, simply the reduction. So addition of hydrogens is also reduction or removal of oxygen is also reduction, right. So if both reduction and oxy oxidation are occurring in the same reaction, then it is called as a redox reaction, okay. So breath analyzer test, uh, one of the example which you will be observing in the uh, day to day life is so the police people will be standing in uh, in the middle of the road and uh, checking uh, whether uh, the driver or uh, whoever is driving the vehicle has consumed alcohol or not right what do they do so they will bring a, a detector machine and they will ask you to blow the air through the mouth so what happens here means if there is an ethanol so the dichromate ion undergoes a redox reaction and results in the formation of conversion of the alcohol into the carbonyl compound that is the acetaldehyde. So there is a change in the oxidation state of the chromium from in the left hand side as well as the right hand side. So which gives you an indication in terms of reading, right. So based on the uh, value, so they will uh, identify whether you have consumed too much of alcohol or uh, very limited or nothing, right. So this is what the different types of organic reactions are. So therefore, what we say is the transformation of the reactant molecules into the product is seen uh, in any one of the following categories, right. And the other thing is the transformation may not be always in a single step, okay. So it might need several steps to convert from the reactant to the product level. For example, if A has to convert into X, so A is the reactant molecule while X is the product in this case. So it may not be a straightforward conversion from A to X. It may lead to the conversion of A initially to byproduct or the intermediate product B, which can be transformed further to C and later it may convert into the X which is the final product that means there are several other steps involved in the conversion of a reactant molecule to the product. If you are studying the details of each and every step which is involved in the transformation of the reactant molecule to the product we call it as the reaction mechanism. What you call it as a reaction mechanism. So the definition of a reaction mechanism is like so when you have a detailed study on the steps involved in the transformation of a reactant molecule to the corresponding product molecule, we call it as a reaction mechanism. So how is this transformation happening? How is transformation happening? So if I have this one, if uh, this is the reactant molecule, so I need to convert it into a product, what should happen? So one thing is I should break it, so therefore, this is an entirely different uh, molecule and this is also an entirely different molecule which is quite different from the reactant molecule that is the starting product, right. What I have done here, so I have broke a existing bond. So that means the transformations happens only when you are breaking the existing bonds or making the new bonds. So what, what should happen for the transformations? So breaking of the existing bonds should happen at the same time making of new bonds should also be seen in the transformation of the reactant to products. So So these two should happen in order to convert the reactant molecules into the products, right. So when you talk about the details of breaking the bond, existing bond, let us say it is an organic molecule and generally the atoms are connected together with a covalent bond. For example, if X and Y are the two atoms of a molecule which are connected via a covalent bond, what do you mean by a covalent bond? X is contributing a single electron and Y is contributing a single electron but X and Y together are equally sharing the bonded electron pair. So those pair electrons are shared equally by X and Y. So now, so the types of bond breaking may be 
categorized into two. One is homolytic fission and the other is heterolytic fission. So homolysis and heterolysis are the two different types of bond breaking procedures. So as we have discussed earlier, if X and Y are the two atoms of a molecule which are connected via a covalent bond, the covalent bond is a resultant of equal contribution of electrons and equal sharing of the electron pair. So now if it has to break this bond, in a homolytic uh, fashion means that X is taking back an electron while Y is also taking back its own electron. So what does it result in? They result in the formation of X with a single electron. We call such kind of species as radicals and again Y with a single electron. So as a result of the homolytic fission in an organic reaction, you will be seeing the formation of free radicals as the intermediates. You will see the free radicals as the intermediates. right? So the best example for this free radical formation is seen in the case of halogens like bromine. Under sunlight, so if you irradiate the bromine molecule, it is subjected to homolytic fission. It is subjected to homolytic fission as a result of which you will be able to see the bromine radicals which acts as the initiators. So they will start the reaction and thereafter the free radical reaction will continue until the existence of the reactant molecule. Right. So this is how the homolytic fission will result in. So the homolysis is generally represented by an arrow like this. What does this arrow called as? These arrows are called as fish hook head arrow. So the arrows which are called as fish hook head arrow, they will generally represent the homolysis of a molecule. Okay. So the other type of reaction or bond breaking is heterolytic fission. So the second type of bond breaking is by heterolytic fission. For example, if you have two atoms connected by a covalent bond in a molecule and one thing for sure you need to see here is the difference in the electronegativity between these two atoms. Right? In such cases, the more electronegative atom, even though the bond is as a resultant of equal contribution of an electron and equal sharing of the electron pair, so one of the atoms involved in the molecule or in the bond will tend to forcibly take the electron pair with it. So what is happening if the bonded pair of electrons are completely taken by Y then as a resultant of this you will be seeing X with a positive charge because it has lost the electrons and then Y with a negative charge because it has taken the bonded pair of electrons. So as a result of heterolytic fission, you will be seeing the ions as the intermediates. You will be seeing ions. So what type of ions? An ion with a positive charge as well as an ion with a negative charge. So the positively charged ions, if it is a carbon ion, carbon ion with a positive charge, you call it as carbocation, right? Or simply a cationic species and if it is a negatively charged species you call it as anionic species anionic species so generally these positively charged species are considered as electrophiles so they act as electrophiles whereas these negatively charged species those are anions will act as nucleophiles, right. So with the homolytic fission, the resultant uh, species 
you are be, uh, you will be able to see is the radicals whereas with the heterolytic fission you will be seeing the charged species so which can act as electrophiles or nucleophiles okay so this is how the existing bond is going to break so the reverse of this the reverse the combination of these is going to result in the formation of a new bond okay so that is all about the bond breaking process and also the bond making process in a reaction mechanism okay if you want to study the stepwise conversion of the reactant molecule to the product in between you will be able to see such kind of species forming and uh, driving you towards the product so therefore we can classify this organic reaction mechanisms into two types one is the radical reactions where you will be seeing the generation of the radicals in between the transformation of reactants to products or you can classify these reactions organic reactions as ionic reactions where you will be able to see the generation of ions in between the transformation from reactant to products okay so a general organic reaction will be under the influence of concentration of the reactant of the reactant species or it may be also under the influence of the reaction conditions for example if you are heating the reaction mixture that is the reactants in order to transform them into the products so the temperature plays a key role in the transformation okay so temperature is one of the reaction conditions which makes you feel like the reaction is under the control of temperature sometimes so other thing is also the nature of the solvent sometimes some reactions may prefer to happen in the polar solvents sometimes some reactions may be happening in the non polar solvents and with the change in uh, the nature of the solvent the reaction also changes so the, there will be a certain influence on the conversion of the reactants to the products okay when you see the typical energy profile of an organic reaction it will look like the typical energy profile of an organic reaction when you plot a graph between the energy on y axis versus reaction progress on the x axis when you plot a graph between the energy and the reaction uh, progress what you can understand here is there is certain amount of energy even for the reactant molecules if you have the reactant molecules they do have they do have some amount of energy which we call it as the free energy of the reactant molecules right so this free energy of reactant molecules is not quite sufficient enough to convert them into the products what we need to do you need to supply some amount of extra energy so that the reactant molecule slowly gains that energy and then after some time transforms into a different uh, molecule which is called as product so this is the free energy of the product whereas this is the free energy of the reactant molecule so what you are doing is you are giving the extra amount of energy required for this reactant molecules to cross this energy barrier and then get transformed into the products therefore the difference of this energy what you are giving in excess for the this this level of energy which you are supplying in addition is nothing but activation energy so what do you call this as means it is the activation energy so right so why it is called as activation energy so already the reactant molecules have some amount of energy which is not sufficient enough to cross this activation barrier and then transform into the products so therefore externally we are giving some amount of energy because of which the molecule starts colliding with each other when the molecule starts colliding and if the collisions are fruitful enough 
So then those molecules will cross the activation barrier and then transforms into the products. So this uh, amount of energy is called as activation energy and this point where you can see the transition between the reactants to the products is called as transition state. So this is called as transition state. So this is a typical energy profile for an organic reaction. So the amount of energy you are supplying for the transformation of the reactants to products is called as activation energy, right? So generally we can say that the rate of a reaction, that means how speed the reaction is happening is also a function of the activation energy, is also a function of the activation energy. So for example, so if you see this conversion, which is a reversible process, again you will be plotting between reaction progress and energy, right? So what is happening here? So there is a reactant with some amount of free energy upon absorbing some amount of extra energy, it is transforming into a product with a different amount of free energy, right? So and the energy difference between the free energy of the reactant and the amount of energy required to cross the activation barrier is called as activation energy. This is called as activation energy, right? So this activation energy is also represented by delta G double dagger. So this is for the forward reaction. So when if you assume that this has to reversibly go back to the reactant molecule, what should happen here? This is the reaction progress axis and this is the energy axis, right? So what is happening now? In the reverse direction, this becomes the reactant and this has to be the product. So that means the reactant is having extremely low free energy and the products are having high free energy in the reverse process. So now the difference between the reactants free energy and this point is called as activation energy which can again be represented by this delta G double dagger, right? So when you closely look into these two reactions, this is assumed to be a forward reaction while this is a backward reaction, right? So from the energy profile, it is clearly evident that the conversion of the reactant molecule to the product that is the forward reaction is highly favorable. Whereas the conversion of this reactant uh, that is the product backward to the reactant molecule here in this case is not favorable. So this type of reactions are called as irreversible reactions. This type of reactions are called as irreversible reactions. When you have the energy is comparably equal, uh, so not exactly means also is fine. If it is comparably equal between the reactants free energy and the products free energy, so then there is a chance of reversibility. That is the reactant can transform into the product and at the same time products can come back to the reactants state. Okay, so that is what you can see. So now here the delta G for the forward reaction is less than delta G for the backward reaction. So this is backward reaction delta G which is higher and then this is forward reactions delta G which is much much lower. So this condition refers to the reversible reaction, right? So why we have discussed with this means? In the above two said uh, reaction profiles, we came to know that the ease of reaction depends upon the delta G, right? So that is the activation energy. If the activation energy required 
is minimal so then the ease of reaction is more if the activation energy required is more so then the ease of reaction is very less so now come to the exothermic uh, reaction type and also an endothermic reaction type so it is almost similar to what we have uh, discussed now and an exothermic reaction can be shown like So reactants are having more energy when compared to product and the amount of activation energy required is less. <coughs> right. When you see this, the difference of energy between the free energy and the activation energy is nothing but delta G. Right. So the difference of energy between the reactants and the products gives you the change in enthalpy change in enthalpy which is represented by delta h naught okay so this delta h naught plays a key role how the reaction is happening to understand how the reaction is happening if delta h naught is negative that is the change in enthalpy is negative so those type of reactions are named as exothermic reactions exothermic reactions in addition after the completion of reaction you will be observing some amount of heat being liberated from the reaction so which are called as exothermic reactions so exothermic reactions will have delta h as negative and the product here is more stable than the reactant molecule right so the product is having less energy when compared to the reactant molecule therefore obviously the product is more stable when compared to the reactant molecule and one more important uh, thing about this kind of exothermic reactions is the equilibrium constant so equilibrium constant equilibrium constant k is greater than 1 for the so the equilibrium constant k is greater than 1 for the exothermic reactions so now you can easily see the endothermic uh, reaction right how should it be yeah so the energy of the products is greater compared to energy of the reactants and the difference of energy between the products free energy and the reactants free energy is again called as delta h naught so here in this case because these are endothermic reactions so you can see the delta h naught is positive in the endothermic reactions it is positive whereas in the exothermic reactions the delta h naught is negative right so and the product is less stable compared to the reactant molecule here product is less stable than the reactant molecule and therefore the equilibrium constant k is less than 1 so whereas for an exothermic reaction it is greater than 1 for an endothermic reaction the equilibrium constant k is less than 1 so these reactions are endothermic in nature right so these are the basics of any type of organic reactions so why we have discussed here means we are now going to see some different type of chemistry in the organic molecules which is named as pericyclic reactions right so we'll go into the characteristics of the pericyclic reactions and who is responsible for the development of the pericyclic reactions and the details right so there are certain other uh, types of reactions 
which we have seen uh, earlier right so when the bond is breaking they are intended to give some reactive intermediates like either radicals or the ionic species okay so those reactions will show the energy profile like this So they will have certain amount of free energy at the reactant level and then initially after absorbing some amount of energy they will reach the activation energy point of the slowest step. So then they will show a drop in uh, energy requirement and then again they will transform into the product. So this is the product and this is the reactant. So this corresponds to the transition state of this corresponds to the transition state of the slowest step that is the ionization step okay so ionization step so when there is a drop in the energy so what does it mean means there are some intermediate uh, uh, systems appearing in between the transformation of the reactant to the product and we call them as reactive intermediates we call them as what reactive intermediates for example the nucleophilic substitution so if it is rbr which is an alkyl halide so if it is undergoing nucleophilic substitution by means of sn1 mechanism what is happening first the cleavage of the bond is taking place resulting in the formation of ionic species like R plus a positively charged species and also Br minus a negatively charged species. Then in the second step what is happening this R plus is getting attacked by a different nucleophile. So if you use a different nucleophile so then you will be seeing here a product with the different nucleophile this is a substitution reaction right of course or br is the reactant molecule where after reaching certain energy point so ionization has happened you are able to see now the reactive intermediates and after that the replacement of the species or substitution of this bromine ion by a different new nucleophile is happening and therefore you are able to see the products so this is how the energy profile will be seen in the case of the molecules where their transformation is happening without the formation of the reactive intermediates through a transition state and some of the transformations happening with the formation of the reactive intermediates okay. so the purpose of discussing all these things is to show how different the pericyclic reactions are from this general type of uh, organic reactions and who developed the pericyclic reactions okay and what are the characteristic properties of the pericyclic reactions that has made them a special type of organic reactions so pericyclic reactions are of course a special type of organic reactions so the name pericyclic what is the name pericyclic reactions and its applications is the course we are uh, dealing now right so the name pericyclic means that around the cycle so the reaction is happening around a cycle so around what type of cycle means it is the cycle of electrons again the question comes what type of electrons so it is the pi electrons so where you can see the pi electrons in the unsaturated molecules so pericyclic reactions are happen to be seen in the case of unsaturated systems which are conjugated which are conjugated so unsaturated molecules can only show the pericyclic reactions so that is the concept or that is the meaning of the title pericyclic reactions okay so who developed this pericyclic reaction means the first name you can see even though in 1950s itself 
a type of pericyclic reaction has been already discussed and it is so popular in the name of Diels Alder reaction. So, the development of the pericyclic reactions was started by R.B. Woodward. So, the development of pericyclic reactions is started by R.B. Woodward. Who is he? So, R.B. Woodward is a Nobel laureate who is a professor at Harvard University. So, he is a professor at Harvard University. So, he is so intelligent in chemistry that in the doctoral uh, time itself, he has synthesized the uh, hormone uh, estrogen. Okay. So, then he worked at different levels in different positions at Harvard University. Right. So, and then he initially started his work on the UV visible spectroscopy of the complex molecules, natural molecules. So, with which he formulated a rule called as Woodward rule. So, using the Woodward rule, you can try to elucidate the structure of the complex molecules, natural complex molecules. So, that much of contributions he has made in his early career itself. So, then he started working on the much more complex uh, molecules and then he is the one person who has synthesized the malarial drug. What is the malarial drug? It is an alkaloid called quinine. So, he synthesized the malarial drug quinine. Okay. So, later because of his contributions to the uh, steroid uh, chemistry or the molecules of uh, natural complex uh, molecules. So, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1965 itself. So, he got the Nobel Prize in the year 1965. Then he started understanding the pericyclic reactions. So, because while synthesizing this uh, complex natural molecules, he has seen some of the transformations are happening without any intermediate or uh, uh, in a single step. Okay. So, those transformations are in particularly connected to the unsaturated area of, of the complex molecule. So, and he also observed that when these type of reactions are happening, under so, uh, special conditions like either in the thermal conditions or in the photochemical conditions, he was able to see a particular stereochemistry. So, he understood that these reactions are also highly stereospecific in nature. So, then he started working on this area and he was the root cause for the development of the pericyclic reactions. Later, along with uh, Professor R.B. Woodward, or Hoffman. So, Hoffman is also a professor at Cornell University, right. So, he is a theoretician. So, R. B. Woodward along with R. Hoffman, so they had, uh, you know, several several uh, kind of uh, studies done uh, to understand the pericyclic reactions they worked together and developed the pericyclic reactions to the next level so then r hoffman along with professor fukai who is a professor at kyoto university japan So, these two have worked parallelly. So, he is a physical chemist and he is a theoretician and he is an organic synthetic chemist. See? So, the combination of these three is responsible for the development of the pericyclic reactions which is a special type of organic reactions. So, because of the enormous contributions of these two Hoffman and Fukai, so again a Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded in the year of 1981. So, in the year 1981 a Nobel Prize was awarded. For whom? So, both Professor Hoffman as well as Professor Fukai. So, the question is why Woodward was not there in this Nobel Prize? So, there is an unfortunate reason like so 
Professor Woodward has passed away just two years before the award of the Nobel Prize in 1979. So that's why he was unable to share the uh, Nobel Prize for his contributions here, right? So now coming to the characteristics of the pericyclic reactions. So as already mentioned, pericyclic reaction means around the cycle. So that means you will be able to see the cyclic transition state because of the cyclic reorganization of the unsaturated electrons or pi electrons in the unsaturated molecules. So pericyclic reactions are happen to be seen in the case of molecular molecules with unsaturation. So you can see the pericyclic reactions only in the case of molecules with unsaturation. Okay. So it is seen in the case of unsaturated systems. So most of the pericyclic reactions are unimolecular in nature. Most of the pericyclic reactions are unimolecular in nature. So unimolecular means it does not mean like all the pericyclic reactions are unimolecular. So you should kindly understand that very few of the pericyclic reactions are only unimolecular in nature. So then coming to the another specific characteristic property of the pericyclic reaction. So these pericyclic reactions are concerted. So concerted in nature. So pericyclic reactions follow the concerted type of mechanism. Okay. So rate of bond breaking will be equal to the rate of bond making simultaneously. Okay. So and also majority of the pericyclic reactions are synchronous in nature as well. So majority of the pericyclic reactions are synchronous in uh, nature and they follow the concerted mechanism and they are seen as unimolecular reactions observed in the case of unsaturated systems. So another beautiful uh, thing is the pericyclic reaction always passes through a cyclic transition state. So that means in the pericyclic reaction you cannot see the formation or generation of the ionic species or the radicals or any kind of intermediates. right? So the pericyclic reactions will never produce any ionic species or ionic products and then they will never involve in the generation of the radicals or any kind of reactive intermediates. So they will just happen in a single step, single step, right? So the reactant will be immediately transforming into the product simultaneously with the bond breaking and also the bond break making. So concerted means what? So simultaneously the bond breaking will be happening at the same time. So bond making will also be happening, right? So they never produce any reactive intermediates will not show any reactive intermediates. So the most important property of the pericyclic reactions is so these pericyclic reactions are highly stereospecific in nature. So they are highly stereospecific in nature. That means if you know the stereochemistry of the reactant molecule and if you fix the reaction condition then you can easily estimate the stereochemistry of the product to be formed. So these reactions are highly stereospecific and a pericyclic reaction can be triggered or initiated or can be seen only by inducing either light energy or heat energy. So if a pericyclic reaction is driven because of the heat energy, you call it as thermal pericyclic reactions and if the pericyclic reaction is happening because of the irradiation with light energy, you call it as photo pericyclic 
reaction right so any pericyclic reaction can happen either in the thermal condition or in the photochemical condition if you fix the reaction condition like if you want to see the transformation of the reactant molecule with a specific stereochemistry under thermal condition you will get a product with a specific stereochemistry only right so if you take the same reactant molecule but change the reaction condition like from uh, thermal to photochemical uh, energy that is uh, h nu light energy so you will be seeing entirely different stereochemistry in the product right so that is the beauty of the pericyclic reactions okay so majority of the pericyclic reactions are majority of the pericyclic reactions are reversible in nature so there will be certain uh, uh, number of exemptions right so you cannot apply uh, this as a generalized rule for 100% of the pericyclic reactions so majority of them are reversible in nature and they will not produce any kind of ionic intermediates they are highly stereospecific in nature and pericyclic reactions can be induced by either heat or by light and then so they are synchronous in nature follows the concerted mechanism and you can see always the cyclic transition states and these are unimolecular elementary reactions that means the reaction happens in a single step so okay so the next important thing you need to also look at the characteristic property look as the characteristic property for the pericyclic reactions is in the case of general organic reactions we have already discussed like so those reactions are under the influence of either the solvent properties or the reaction conditions like temperature or light whatever and then uh, they are also depending upon the concentration of the reactant molecule right but pericyclic reactions they may be also influenced by the catalysts okay but pericyclic reactions are not influenced by PCRs. Pericyclic reactions are not influenced by so it is not influenced by the nature of the solvent. So whatever may be the solvent, so it has no effect on the pericyclic reaction whether rate is not going to change or product is not going to change so that means they are independent of nature of the solvent okay so they does not depend upon the catalyst also so pericyclic reactions does not depend upon the acid catalyst or alkali catalyst Whereas normal organic reactions you can influence with the usage of the acid catalyst or alkali catalyst. You can speed up the reaction or you can decrease the reaction or whatever it may be. Right. So again pericyclic reactions are also not influenced by metal based catalyst. <coughs> okay. And then pericyclic reactions are not influenced by either the presence of a nucleophile or the presence of an electrophile so you cannot influence the pericyclic reaction by changing simply the polarity or nature of the solvent and you cannot influence the pericyclic reactions by adding an acid catalyst or an alkali catalyst or you cannot also influence the pericyclic reactions by using a metal based catalyst and again you cannot influence the pericyclic reactions by the presence of a nucleophile or an electrophile. So these are the characteristic properties of the pericyclic reactions which made them a special type and among the other organic reactions. So in the next class we will be uh, discussing about the types of the pericyclic reactions. So thank you so much for your attention and we will meet in the next class.